Topic four is a discussion of the student's t-test, which is a parametric test that is used for comparing the means of two different groups. It's useful for comparing the means of one group that's measured at two points in time, or comparing one sample mean to a test statistic. We will also describe the homogeneity of variance, which uh, is the Levine's test that we need to use when comparing two different groups, and effect size. The z-test that you were introduced to earlier helped us to compare a sample mean to the normal distribution. The z-distributions are based on the normal curve and allow us to estimate a theoretical population parameter. But what if we want to know if a group mean is different from a particular value or a test statistic? What if we want to know if the sample mean of a particular variable is different from the mean of another group, say an experimental versus a control group? What if we want to compare the mean of our variable of interest at two points in time, say a group that we provide an intervention to? We would do that with a t-test. The t-distribution is based on sample size and it can vary according to degrees of freedom. And this is a um, formula for the t-test where we compare two different groups. The x-bar 1 is the mean of the first group and x-bar 2 is the mean of the second group over the square root of the variances of the two groups added together. Remember in a previous lecture we explained that degrees of freedom is the number in the sample minus 1. We use degrees freedom instead of the total number when conducting the t-test to assure that all the numbers in the sample are free to vary. So as a reminder, I'll give you another example. Uh, there could be any set of numbers that would produce a mean of 4. We could pick the first number as 4 and the second number as 6. That would mean that the third number has to be 2 in order for these three numbers to produce a mean of 4. The first two numbers are free to vary, but the last one is not, so we subtract 1 from the total number of subjects or observations in the sample. When we conduct a t-test, uh, we will have a degrees of freedom for groups in some cases or the degrees of freedom for the entire sample. So degrees of freedom in case of the t-test is n minus 1 for every independent group in a comparison. If we're looking at one group, it's going to be n minus uh, 1 for the number in the sample. The t-test has four assumptions that must be met in order for us to use it. And here they are. The assumption number one is normal distribution. Remember when you did descriptive statistics, one of the things that you looked at was skewness and kurtosis. And so when you uh, use a parametric test like the t-test, the assumption must be met that the data are normally distributed. They are not skewed. However, if the sample sizes of both groups that you're comparing is greater than 30, we don't really have to worry about violating that assumption too much. The second assumption is that the independent variable must be nominal because we're going to compare categories and the dependent variable must be continuous, ordinal or higher and should have a normal distribution. As we said before, if we have a small sample size and the data are skewed, we may get ambiguous test results. Number four, we have to assure homogeneity of variance when comparing two independent groups. If we're comparing group A to group B, we have to be sure that the observations or sample is, uh, has an equal variance to each other. And to do that, we conduct a special test called the Levine's test. So in order to use the t-test statistic to compare two different group means, we call this an independent samples t, we must assure that the variances of each group are similar. We calculate that with the Levine's test and it's illustrated with the letter F. Later on you'll learn that F also is the uh, representation for ANOVA and the reason for that is that the Levine's is a special type of ANOVA. Now we're going to calculate t-test by hand as well but we don't usually calculate a Levine's when we do the by hand method because we're really only trying to find a critical value along the uh, normal distribution needed to reject the null. 
when we use SPSS to test a null hypothesis of the t-test, uh, SPSS will generate the actual t-score and the associated p-value, and it will uh, compute the Levine's, again, when you're comparing two different groups. But our result will be the same whether we're testing by hand or going through and using the software. There are three types of t-tests. The first one is called the one sample t. This is where you measure a group mean against a test value. So um, you might want to know, is the mean systolic blood pressure of adult black men in the United States greater than 120? And our test value would be 120. Since we're only looking at one group, the degrees of freedom is the number of individuals in the group minus one. Another type of t-test is the independent samples t-test that we've been talking about. This is where you take the mean of one group for a particular variable and you uh, answer the question, is it different from the mean of another group? Since we're looking at two different groups, the degrees of freedom is the number minus two. And here's an example. Is the mean systolic blood pressure of adult black men in the United States greater than the mean systolic blood pressure of adult white men in the United States? And finally, the paired samples t. Again, we don't need Levine's because we're measuring a variable in one group at two different points in time. So the same subjects are measured twice. In our degrees of freedom are n minus 1. And an example would be, is the mean systolic blood pressure of adult black men who took part in a weight management program lower at post-treatment than at baseline? You remember we said before that whenever we have a directional hypothesis, we use a one-tailed test to test the um, null, and when you have a non-directional hypothesis, you would use a two-tail. Well, the same is true with the t-test. We use a two-tailed t-test for a non-directional hypothesis. Let's say that we wanted to know if there was a difference in mean weight loss between two diet programs. We would use that two-tailed test. We could also write a directional hypothesis. Mean weight loss would be greater or, or not greater in subjects who selected one type of diet over another. The key, though, is SPSS will not calculate a, uh, it will not test a directional hypothesis. It will generate the t-value or the obtained value and the probability for the two-tailed test. But if you wanted to write a directional hypothesis, you would need to take that t-value that SPSS provides and look up the value in the table in the back of the book that's needed to reject the null. Because of that, um, uh, many times you're going to want to use a, a one-tail test since it's more robust and should be used whenever you know that, that the literature suggests a direction. But so that we can do that, uh, we're going to do, learn in this lecture how to calculate the t by hand and compare it with the critical value, and we're also going to go through the steps using SPSS. So let's uh, go through a couple of examples. These are the eight steps for the calculation of a t-test. We write the research and null hypothesis. We set our level of significance. We select the appropriate test statistic. We compute the obtained value, and in this case it's going to be one of the t-tests. We determine the value that's needed to reject the null by comparing it to the t-distribution in table B2 of your book. We compare our value that we computed to that critical value and we make a decision to reject or fail to reject the null and then we correctly write the conclusions. And I want to make a point about writing conclusions. Um, now that we're doing parametric tests and, and we tried to be specific on uh, the descriptives, but we must be very careful when we write conclusions now in these uh, of these parametric tests. We have to follow the APA format. So when you uh, do your homework, make sure that you, you that you follow these procedures. So here's a hypothetical situation. Let's say that a rehab hospital has discovered a new type of exercise that promises greater range of motion in patients who've had joint replacements than the current exercises they're using. 
So we want to test for differences in range of motion between these two exercises. Range of motion is tested in eight subjects using both types of exercise and then we compare for differences. So our null and research hypothesis, there's no difference in RON between the two different exercises and there is a difference. And we set our level of significance at 0 0.05 and in this case we're going to select the dependent samples T because we're looking at one group and two outcomes. We go through the steps that are illustrated on page 192 of your book to calculate the value of T and we find that it's 8.742 for this particular sample. We then go to table B2 and using degrees freedom of 7, remember there were 8 in the sample, so 8 minus 1 is 7 and we determine the critical value needed to reject the null is 2.365. I would encourage you to open your book and look at table B2 and make sure that you also come up with the same number. Since our obtained value is greater than the critical value, we reject the null and we correctly conclude that there is a difference in range of motion between two exercise methods where T of 7DF equal 8.742 and our P is less than 0 0.05. Let's look at another type of t-test. Let's say that a rehab hospital has experienced an increase in fall rates according to the quality management department. The nursing supervisor also noticed an increase in the orders for blood transfusions during that same time period. The staff decides to conduct a test to see if there's a difference in fall rates between patients with anemia and those without anemia. And so we use our famous eight steps. We s hypothesize that there would be a difference and then our null is there would be no difference in fall rates between anemic and non-anemic patients. We set our level of significance and this time we're going to select the independent samples t-test because we're going to look at two groups of at least 30 people tested at one time for a single outcome. We calculate our t-value and we find that it's 3.122 and then we look at table B2 and now we have degrees freedom of 58 because we have two groups of 30 so n minus 1 plus n minus 1 would be 58 and we determine the critical value needed to reject the null is 2.001. Since our obtained value is greater than the critical value along the t-distribution, we also reject the null. And we correctly write that there is a difference between fall rates of patients with anemia and patients who do not have anemia. T degrees freedom 58 equal 3.122 and our P is less than 0 0.05. Having seen this, the chief nursing officer decides to put all the patients in bed who are anemic so that they don't have an increase in fall rates. But is this something we really want to do? Let's talk about effect size. This measures the magnitude of our results. Yes, we know there's a difference, but how big is that difference? Do we really want to put everyone in the hospital who has a low hemoglobin and a matocrit in bed when they only have 21 days to regain functional independence? There are many methods that are available to calculate effect size, but your text presents the one by Jacob Cohen, and they use D uh, to represent that figure. And you see the, um, the uh, formula here. A large effect size means that groups are quite dissimilar regarding a particular variable. There's little overlap between the group. Large effect size equal low overlap. A large effect size means that the difference is really big. And you see the numbers here. A small effect would be 0.2, medium 0.5, and large 0.8. So let's say that we calculate the effect size of our study for that previous t-test for anemia and falls, and we find that it's 0.12. This is a small effect size. Rather than putting all the patients in the bed who have anemia, Perhaps we need to look at other factors that are contributing to increased fall rates. We've looked at the hand method of 
calculating the t-test and looking in the back of the book to compare our obtained value to our critical value needed to reject the null. Now let's see how to do this in SPSS. Using your familiar, the data set that you're familiar with, the Healthy Schools Project, let's see if there's a difference in percent body fat between boys and girls. Now this particular data set goes from kindergarten through third grade. You probably know there'd be a difference in percent body fat once uh, young people hit puberty, but what about this data set where the average age is between six and seven years old? Since we're comparing two independent groups with a single measurement, we select the independent samples t-test. We write our null. There's no difference in percent body fat of boys and girls in this particular study. Or the research hypothesis, there is a difference in percent body fat of boys and girls in the sample. And I've listed these steps here for you so that you'll be able to do this yourself when you do your homework. So let's um, go to the data set and complete this example to help you out when you do your own homework. So we select Analyze and we're going to compare means and we're going to select the independent samples t-test. We're going to move percent body fat to the test variable and we're going to move gender to the grouping variable and SPSS wants us to define this since it's a term, a word, in terms of numbers and uh, if you remember in the code book we said males would be one and females would be two. We continue. We want to make sure that we've set our level of significance and properly. And now we select OK. Isn't that nice? SPSS just really pops it out for us. Let's go back to the PowerPoint and see if we can make sense of these output files. So what you see is that SPSS generates two tables. A little bit of the, the descriptives here. We can see that we have very large sample size in the cell, certainly greater than 30. And we see there is a difference in the mean percent body fat and in the standard deviation. What we want to know is if, if that's really significant. So we come down here to the independent samples t-test. Notice that we have to check for homogeneity of variance between males and females in our sample. Are they, do they have an equal distribution? And so SPSS runs a Levine's for us and we see that it is significant. What that means is that the two groups are quite different. So we cannot report the top line. The top line assumes that the variances are equal. We see that they are not so we have to come down and report equal variances not assumed and let our reader know that we have violated the assumption of homogeneity of variance. So we would report it as there is a significant difference in percent body fat between boys and girls in our research project where TDF is 300 and equal to minus 2.870 and P is equal to 0 .004 and we must say equal variance is not assumed. Now even though we are admitting that equal variances are not assumed, uh, should we be concerned about that? Can we trust our results? And the, uh, even though we violated this fourth assumption of the t-test? And the answer is yes. Uh, we're good with it because we have this very large sample size and if you notice there's really not much difference in our results. Uh, the t-scores are, are fairly equivalent, but uh, you would have seen a big, big difference between these two lines had we had very small sample sizes. So we feel good about our result even though we had to uh, violate one of the assumptions to report our results. So there's a significant difference in percent body fat between boys and girls in our research project, but how big is that difference? What we want to do is use a handy online tool to calculate Cohen's D, or effect size. And we're going to need some information from our descriptive chart that we saw on the previous slide, uh, the mean and the standard deviation of our two samples. So we go to this really nice website, 
and we enter the mean of group 1 and the standard deviation of group 1 which was male 7.72 and we go back and do the same for females 24 and 9.58 and we calculate and we see that our effect size is 0.229 we go back to our PowerPoint we see that's a very small effect so yes they're different but it's not that big a deal at least not at this age so our research is significant uh, our difference is significant but the magnitude of that difference is really quite small remember we said SPSS will only generate a two-tailed test of significance what if we have sufficient evidence to propose a directional hypothesis? In the case of the research question, are boys and girls different in percent body fat? We have a lot of evidence that says even little infant boys have less body fat than girls. We have sufficient evidence to write a directional hypothesis and use a one-tailed test of significance. And remember, always use a directional hypothesis when you can. The test is more robust and our results are more reliable. So here's how we would write our null and research hypothesis. In the project, girls have more body fat than boys, since that's what the literature tells us. Or in the project, uh, in this we could write the other, in the girls do not have significantly greater percent body fat than boys. The t-score generated by SPSS was minus 2.870. Now we're going to use this number to look at the t-distribution in the back of the book. Do not worry about the negative sign. I promise it doesn't matter in this case. If we look at table B2 on page 355, we find the critical value needed to reject the null for a one-tailed test with a CI of 95% is 1.645. So, the computed statistic is greater than 1.645 because we're not worrying about the negative sign. The obtained value is greater than the critical value, so even using the by hand method and selecting a one tail test which is more stringent and robust, we still reject our null about, uh, about there being a difference in boys and girls in the sample regarding body fat. Using data from our uh, Healthy Schools project, let's see if there's a difference in calculated BMI at the beginning of the school year compared to the end of the school year. Since we're comparing two means from the same group of subjects, we will select the paired samples t-test to test our null. And we've written our null as you see here on the screen. And these are the steps that we will go through to compute a paired samples T. So we go to the file and we're going to select analyze and compare means and this time we will select the paired samples T test. And Notice it gives you two variable boxes. We're going to find calculated BMI1. This is the one we took at the beginning of the year and we're going to scroll down until we find calculated BMI2 which was taken at the end of the school year make sure our confidence interval is where we want it and we select OK how simple is that? three different tables generated and let's go back to our slideshow here and look at our results So here's our first table. We notice that there is a difference in the calculated BMIs of children measured at the beginning and the end of the year. The standard deviation between the two means is similar, but we don't have to worry about Levine's because we're testing the same group at two different points in times. In the second table, we see a new table here that SPS has generated. It's a correlation. Now the type of correlation is a point by serial where we look at a nominal, relation, a nominal variable and its relationship to a continuous variable. And if you've forgotten what that is, go back to chapter 5 and look at the table 
on the different types of correlations that you can run. Uh, this particular correlation is provides a measure of the effect size. You know, when we did the effect size calculator earlier, we had two different groups, but this is the same group. What I'm telling you is that you have a way of measuring the magnitude of a difference, should there be one, and it is uh, they use this by serial correlation. In this application, a correlation of 0.1 is very small, 0.3 is a medium effect size, and 0.5 or more is a large effect size. So what we see here is that uh, there's a large effect size, should there be one, this would be the magnitude of it. And we'll move on to the third table, which is what we're really after, where it looks at the paired sample, and we get our T, and we see yes. Uh, T equals minus 5.91. Here's our degrees of freedom. And we have a significant value for T. And it's uh, pretty big. So from beginning to the end of the school year, the BMI went up which we might expect if the children had an increase in muscle mass. Uh, you know, just general decrease in body fat is going to increase the, uh, the muscle mass. We don't know. BMI doesn't really tell us a whole lot in children. It's very difficult to interpret, but uh, that's how you run a paired sample t-test. So we can say there is a significant difference in the calculated BMI of subjects in the healthy school sample between the beginning and the end of the academic year where T is equal, uh, degrees freedom of 290 is equal to minus 5.919 and P is equal to zero. All right, one more calculation to go and that's the one sample T. This one is going to look very familiar to the Z-score. If you look at the descriptors from the data below at baseline, you note that the average percent body fat for males in the sample was 22 and for girls it was 24. Now what does that mean? How much body fat should a child have? Well according to the developers of the, of the Tanita scale, which is the scale that we used to measure body fat in these children, a seven-year-old boy should have about 15 percent of their body weight from fat with a range of you know, within 5%, and 7-year-old girls should have about 25% of their body weight from fat, again with a 5% range. So our question is, are the sample means from the boys and the girls significantly different from what we would expect in the uh, population or according to this uh, test statistic? The one sample T will answer this question. So here are the procedures for calculating a one sample T using SPSS. We write our null in our research hypothesis and I've sort of cheated here. I put, uh, I put both males and females in the same. Really you should write four different statements where we treat just the males and just the females in different ones, but um, you know what we're after. Now I'm going to have to do something that you will not have to do on your homework assignment. I'm going to split the data file. And the reason for this is that we're going to have two different test values to compare the sample to, one for boys and one for girls. But these are the general uh, steps for calculating a one sample T. So let's do that. Take a minute here to split the data file. I'm going to compare boys and girls. Whoops, that's not what I'm after. Where'd the gender go? There we are. So we're going to look at the data based on gender. And now we're going to go to Analyze, Compare Means, select a one sample T, and our test variable is percent body fat. Now this is the uh, important part that I'm about to show you. The test value here, let's do males first. Remember we're content, we are testing, uh, is our mean for males 
equal to what is recommended for males and we hit OK and we're going to get uh, a printout here for the males let's go back and do this for the girls analyze compare means the one sample going to change our test value to 25 and we'll get another set of tables now let me show you how to interpret this in SPSS so we have our uh, descriptives but note carefully we first look at the males that first uh, test value of 15 percent I put a line through the female you must ignore this because again we can't compare the women to the test value of 15 it's more appropriate to test them against 25 so if we just look at the males we see that we have a T of 11.5 always if your T is high that's a pretty good sign that you're gonna have significant results our degrees freedom is 161 and significant at the 0, .00 level so we reject the null our sample means for males 22.01 is significantly different from the expected mean of 15 percent the fellas in our sample have a lot of body fat let's look at our results for the women again we cannot look at males because now our test value is 25 and we see that the percent body fat of the women in our sample is not significantly different from what is expected according to the Tanita scale folks which is 25 percent so we retain the null in that situation and I believe that concludes this presentation